So before we begin this morning, as always, I've got a quick question that I wanted to ask you guys. And my question for you this morning is this. Does anyone here or watching online absolutely hate conflict? Who here is not a conflict kind of person? Like, I don't know if it's just me or if it's something that other people deal with, but I absolutely loathe conflict. And the sad part is, is it doesn't matter if it's like big conflict or little conflict. It, it always elicits the same response in me, right? Regardless of what I'm actually dealing with. I, I, I could be at work and have a, a nasty customer calling me every name in the book, uh, making a huge scene, threatening to burn down my house, right? And, and it will make me feel the same way as I feel when Taco Bell forgets my extra sauce. Am I the only one? Does anyone else deal with this? Please raise your hand for that. Don't give me a panic attack before I preach. It won't be pretty. Uh, but real talk, I do. I, I absolutely hate conflict. It elicits such a strange reaction in me, especially knowing in advance, right, that there's going to be conflict in my near future. My, my heart starts beating faster. My hands start to sweat. It gets harder to breathe. My hands get a little shaky, right? Uh, Pastor Jeremy, I think that's clinical anxiety. I want to talk to a doctor about that, just saying. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not that bad, right? But, but it's definitely not enjoyable. It's definitely not enjoyable, that's for sure. But I will say, though, if there's any upside to me absolutely doing everything in my power to avoid conflict in my life, it's that my wife is actually the same way. We both hate conflict so much, and, and what that means for our relationship is that if there's any conflict just kind of hanging in the air, right, we've got to clear it. I swear, we could be in the biggest argument of our marriage, super mad at each other, but less than 20 minutes later, we're apologizing to each other because we just can't have that conflict looming over us. I don't know if it's healthy, but it works for us, so we're, we're good. We're good. Ugh. Man, conflict, it's, it's a funny thing, right? It's something that we all go through, something that we all deal with, and for some, for some, when they deal with conflict, it they completely shut down, right? Like straight up deer in the headlights. When they do try to push through it, their voice quivers and breaks. Got tears streaming down their face for no reason at all. It's crazy. That's definitely not me. I don't know what you're talking about. But for others, man, it seems like when they're presented with conflict, man, it's like... It's like it's their time to shine, right? They, they've been waiting for this moment all day. They remain cool and calm and collected. They speak with perfect clarity and control. They always have a logical, well-thought-out response. It's nuts. I don't understand how they do it. So if that's you, come talk to me after service. Teach me your ways, but don't be threatening about it. I don't want to stress cry today. Uh, just saying. But I was thinking about conflict earlier this week. Uh, not to get super into it, but I, I had a moment this past week where I had to deal with some conflict that had been building up. And, and after it was all said and done, man, it made, made, really made me think. It made me, made me think about how even though we all deal with conflict in different ways, at the end of the day, none of us really want conflict in our lives, right? Whether we thrive under the pressure of conflict or whether we shut down from it. If I were a betting man, I'd wager that, that none of us wants to experience conflict at all. Let me, let me ask, has anyone here seen the movie Miss Congeniality? Anybody? If you haven't seen it, it's good. You should go watch it. Uh, but it's that, that flick with Sandra Bullock about the, what is it, the FBI agent has to go undercover at the Miss America pageant. Uh, I think who else has it got in it? Uh, Benjamin Bratt is in it as well, but if you haven't seen it, go watch it, but in, in it, there's this scene where, where the Miss America contestants, they're at this pageant, and they're, they're asked that super cliche question, right? What is the most important thing our society needs? And it's this compilation shop of all the contestants, just world peace, world peace, and then Sandra Bullock, at the end of it, she, she says, uh, what is it? Uh, harsher punishments for parole violators. And then she waits like five seconds, and world peace, and the crowd goes wild, right? As I began to unpack my thoughts on conflict uh, this last week, for some unknown reason, this scene came to my mind. I don't know why it does it, but my brain works in movies. That's all, that's the only humor I got is pop culture movie references, and my brother can testify to that. But, 
no reason why, this movie popped into my head. And it really made me think, because even though this, this joke was a tongue-in-cheek joke made to poke fun at beauty pageants, I, I honestly do believe that. It's got a little bit of truth to it, right? Because as I said earlier, I think all of us long for a life free of conflict. Right now, we're in our third week of 2022. And something we see often is that when, when one year slips into another, a lot, for a lot of people, the wish for, for peace on earth is on our minds, right? But more than that, more than world peace, when a new year rolls around, most of us find ourselves longing for peace in our own lives. And when we begin to think of peace, oftentimes we, we tend to think of it as the lack of conflict, right? But if we look in the Gospels, if we look at the Bible, something we discover is that peace... Real peace, it means so, something so much more fulfilling. This morning we're in our second week of our new series, Fresh Air, How the Gospel Renews and Revives. When a new year rolls around, many people take it as an opportunity for a fresh start, right? New year, new you. And throughout this series, what we're discovering is that when it comes to the gospel, it actually has this incredible power to, to bring us hope and incredible power to bring us this renewed strength and this incredible power to bring us contentment, regardless of the circumstances we found ourselves in. Week one, we, we talked about how when it comes to our spiritual goals that we set, preparation is key. We talked about how Jesus grew and developed both physically and spiritually before he began his ministry here on earth. We talked about how we need to do the same thing. This morning, as we enter week two of this series, I, I want to talk about peace. I want to talk about what real peace looks like and how it's so much more than simply an absence of conflict. Before we begin, though, as always, would you pray with me, Movement Church? Father God, we thank you for these minutes and these moments we are sharing together today. We thank you that you are just so good to us, God. I thank you for this church. I thank you for your people. I, and I, I just ask, Lord Jesus, that as we dive into your word, as we open up, Father, that, that you would be the only thing on our minds, God, that we can give you the, the attention that you deserve, Father. And, and most importantly, God, I pray that you would speak to us in a new way, that, that you would reveal parts about ourselves, and, and that ultimately, that, that if we're in chaos this morning, God, that you would be able to, to speak your peace into our lives. We say these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. So, if you're following along or if you're taking notes this morning, we're going to be hanging out in the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And if you haven't grabbed one already, uh, we do have bulletins with little note spots on the back if you want them. Uh, I work really hard on them, and it's uh, depressing to throw away 15 of them every day. So, uh, grab them before you come in, and we'll, uh, we'll be good. But before we fully dive into Scripture, I just want to, what I want to do first is I want to give you a little bit of context, a, a little bit of backstory about what we're about to read. Is that okay? Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So, in this chapter, the 14th chapter of the book of John, where we find ourselves in the story, in the narrative, is that Jesus, he's actually mere hours away from the cross. Hours away from the cross. A few days prior to this, he made his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. He, he traveled through the town of Bethany. He, he did this whole thing where he cleansed the table and flipped over chairs and started whipping at people, all, all of it. And in the chapter immediately prior to this, in chapter 13, Jesus, he's actually having his last meal with his ragtag group of friends that he made over the past three years before he dies. And it's here at the Last Supper, like most people call it, that Jesus, he actually dropped some pretty heavy news to his friends. After eating, Jesus does something that we might think a little weird. He, he gets down on his hands and knees and he cleans his, his friend's feet. I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but after that, they finish eating and, and then Jesus lets his friends know that this is the end, right? That one of them is going to go on to betray him and that by this time tomorrow, he'd be dead. Now, understandably, they were all pretty upset, right? In fact, I personally don't think that word would do justice to what these guys are feeling. They, they, they were confused. They were angry. They were hysterical. They were distraught, right? They were just told by their friend that they had spent every day with for the past three years that he was going to die. 
And in response, Jesus does something so amazing. He responds to their worry, to their anxiety, and he does it directly as if he were speaking to their very souls. And, and in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, this is what he says to his distraught friends. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me. That you will also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth. In the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What an awesome sentiment, right? Hey guys, I'm dying. But it's okay because I'm taking you with me, right? Just kidding, that's not what he was saying. At least not literally. No, what Jesus was saying here, boiled down, was this picture that might be a little confusing to us, right? We're reading this, we're seeing him talking about a house and rooms and preparing a place and stuff. And For a lot of us, that might fly over our heads because it's not really culturally relevant. But for his friends, they would know exactly what he's talking about. They would know, it, it would just piece together like that. And it actually comes in two parts. So let me explain for just a second. So the first picture that Jesus was painting for his friends as he was trying to give them comfort was actually a picture of marriage. Of marriage. You know how it says in the Bible a few times that, that Jesus is the groom and we are his bride, right? This actually fits perfectly within that narrative. Because in the culture of the day, when it came to weddings, uh, just a little bit of backstory, the, the way marriage worked in ancient Hebrew culture was it actually started out with a transaction. Unfortunate as it was, in those days, uh, women weren't really seen in the same light as they are today, and marriage was more akin to a business move, a business deal. And it started with a transaction, with, with a sale of sorts. You see, when the weddings occurred, uh, what would happen is, is that when a man was of age to marry, the, fa the man's father would be the main one to arrange the marriage. They still practiced arranged marriages back then, just like some places still do it today. So what the father would do is he would spend some time finding a suitable bride, and, and when he did, he would arrange with the father of the bride to solidify the deal. The thought was is that, that the bride's family was losing a piece of itself, while the, the man's family, the groom's family, was gaining a piece of itself. So an exchange would be made. The father of the groom, in order to make up for that, would pay the father of the bride a dowry, or the, the ancient Hebrew word was mohar, uh, and they would set up the first of two ceremonies. I'm going to screw this uh, word up, but the first one, the first ceremony was called the arusin. Everyone say that with me, arusin. Which, and this, this ceremony, what it did was it marked the betrothal. It marked the promise. And later, they would have the nisween, which marked the actual wedding. Something to know. When the arusin happened, the first ceremony, they were technically married. But what would happen is the, 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 the bride would stay behind while the husband went and did some other stuff. And something interesting is that when it was made... Uh, it sparked this series of events, so to speak. It sparked it into motion that would lead the groom to coming back eventually and taking his bride home with him. Once the betrothal happened, the man would go and basically he would start renovations on his father's house. Since the, since the groom, they usually stayed in a little nook of the father's house, there really wasn't enough room for, for another person to, to come and join the family. So the groom had to make an addition to the house and what this actually signified was essentially the merger of the two families. So, what does that have to do with anything? Jesus, what he was trying to equate this to, again, was that he was the groom and that they were his bride. That what was about to happen was essentially a betrothal, a promise, a promise that he was going to come back to them once he prepared the way. And then we have the second part of the picture that Jesus was painting. 
The other custom that's important to know when it comes to ancient Hebrew marriage is uh, the azer. Azer. And the azer in the culture was pretty much, pretty much amounted to a long-term hype man, right? That was sent to the bride while the husband is away building their new, their new house, preparing the way. The azer was sent to the bride in order to basically keep her spirits up, right? As she waited for the groom to come for her. Because oftentimes, this whole process, it could take a year or more. So they have the first ceremony, and then the, the groom just disappears and goes away, and the bride is left alone to prepare herself and prepare her things, waiting for the groom to come. So the Azar comes and says, hey, you know, this guy's a cool dude. It's going to be worth the wait, lady. It's going to be awesome. You just got to, got to hang in there. You got to keep your spirits high, right? So usually it was a woman, sometimes the sister or even the, the mother of the groom. She would come by periodically to, to check in on the bride, right? Simply to help her quell any anxieties that she had and to help her prepare herself. And this is so cool to me. I know I just vomited a lot of information at you guys, but, but this is so cool because later on in this verse, in verses 26 through 27, Jesus tells his friends this. But the advocate, or the Greek word parakletos, which translates to azer, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Okay, again, a lot of information, but to sum all this up, Jesus is talking about marriage, right? He's telling his friends, look, I'm going to die, but don't worry, because just like a groom promises to come back to his bride in the same way, I'm coming back for you. And yeah, it may be a little bit before I come back, but I'm going to prepare a place for us in my father's house and it's going to be awesome. And, but if that's not enough to keep your anxieties at bay, don't worry. I'm sending an azer. I'm sending the Holy Spirit, someone to come and comfort you. I don't know, ancient Hebrew culture is just something that's so fascinating to me. Because if we think about it, it was, it was culture that is essentially set down by God. There's another, uh, another concept that I want to talk to you guys about, about ancient Hebrew culture. And I'm sure you're probably at least slightly familiar with it. You've probably at least heard the word before. But it's the concept of shalom. Everyone say that with me this morning. Shalom. And this word shalom, it, it can be translated directly as our word for peace, right? But to the ancient Hebrews, man, it was so much more than what we think simply as peace, right? Because when we think of peace, oftentimes we think of it as the absence of conflict. But if we look at the roots of this word, it's so much more than that. Because at its root, the most basic meaning of, of shalom or er, erene for the Greek word, the Greek translation of shalom, what it really boils down to is the thought of completeness, of wholeness. It can refer to uh, a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to it like a stone wall that, that has no gaps or missing bricks, right? It, it refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces, but that's in a state of wholeness or completeness. The core idea is that, is that life is complex. It has a lot of moving parts and, and relationships and situations. And, and when any of these things are out of alignment or missing, then your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb, right? To bring shalom literally means to bring, to, to make complete or to restore. And in verse 27, when Jesus says to his friends that he is giving us his peace, that's what he's talking about, his shalom. Because when it comes to marriage, in ancient Hebrew culture, this was actually kind of the root of it all. 
If you remember from the story of of creation in Genesis, uh, that after God made Adam, he noticed something was missing, right? So he made Eve to complete him. And that's the thought behind all this, that, that when it comes to marriage, this is the root, that together these two families can find completeness, wholeness. Let me ask you, who here remembers their wedding day? If you're married, you better be putting your hand in the air, especially if your spouse is in the room with you, right? If you're married, let me ask you, if you're really honest, as you planned, and as you prepared for that big day, was it always super peaceful? Was it always this serene moment of, I'm so in love, Right? Was it always this relaxing and stress-free time? Probably not. Me, I got married in my grandma's backyard. We went to the Justice of the Peace, and then we bought some pizzas. And it was still stressful. It's probably busy. It was probably stressful, chaotic, making sure everything was right, everything was arranged, everything was perfect. I'm not even going to speak about the bridezillas in the room, but it's okay. Now let me ask you, during that time, during your preparation time, does you have anyone there with you helping you get through it? Do you have anyone speaking to you, telling you it's going to be okay that your bridesmaid's dresses aren't 100% matching? It's okay that you have to use folding chairs instead of some fancier models. It's okay that the tablecloths are forest green instead of uh, dark forest green, I don't know. Because at the root of it all, this is what Jesus is alluding to. That as we wait for the day that he comes back and takes us home with him, yeah, there's going to be some stuff that stresses us out. There's going to be some chaos. There's going to be some conflict that comes up. He's telling us not to worry because even though these things seem huge, even though these things, these things seem like these mountainous issues, he's still coming back. He's still coming back. And in the meantime, He's sending the Holy Spirit to remind us of His perfect, complete shalom. And maybe that's what you need today. I don't know about you, but things are kind of starting to seem a little bit like March 2020 again. I don't know, over the past year, I've kind of just stopped watching the, the coronavirus news and all that stuff. But I saw the other day, our county alone had over 500 active cases in three days. It's, it's stressful. It's giving me flashbacks of being locked in my house for eight weeks, of my last church falling apart. I'm stressed and it's giving me anxiety. But then I remember, no, God, I, I got you. You're bigger than this. You're bigger than the coronavirus. Your movement is, 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 is bigger than all of this. And maybe that's what you need today. But as the world is still reeling from the chaos that started almost three years ago, maybe in the midst of it all, in the midst of the stress and the conflicts, you need His shalom. If you need his peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding, amen? The peace that even though the wind and the waves are raging all around us, they can be calmed but with, with nothing but a word. If that's you today, I know we've gone over a lot of seemingly random information. But if I could simplify it for you all, I'd say this, the gospel, it shows us that what God wants from us isn't following rules and regulations, but he wants us to find our peace, our shalom, our rest in him. We could all begin to trust that he is preparing a way for us. And in the meantime, he's going to be the one to provide our peace and our comfort and our joy in the midst of our chaos. He will be the one to provide that breath of fresh air that we need so desperately. It all boils down to a choice. It all boils down to a choice. So if that's you this morning, and you need that fresh air, like I'm sure we all do, 
I just want you to invite you to make that choice, to make that decision. That decision that says, God, I don't, I, you, even though all this is hard, I'm trusting in you. Even though it might be my last option, I'm choosing to trust in you. Trust that your peace is better than any I could find on my own. Any I can make for myself. So if you'd like to make that decision today, whether it's for the first or the thousandth time, and I say that because I I believe that this is a choice that we need to make every day. (laughs) Wake up in the morning and know, oh, I got got this conflict that, that, that is looming over me today. But God, I'm choosing to trust in you. At lunch, after a hard day, after the long morning, we're, we're sitting down and we're reeling, saying, God, this isn't cool. I'm not having a great day, but I'm choosing to trust in you. At the end of the day, when you're laying your head down on your pillow and thinking to yourself, well, that sucked, but God, I'm trusting in you for a better tomorrow. So if you want to make that decision, all of this starts with that choice. God, I will trust you. God, I will trust you with the big things and with the little things. I stubbed my toe, but I'm trusting you. Mom's got cancer, but I'm trusting you. Coronavirus, two electric boogaloo, I'm trusting you. So if you'd like to make that decision, with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand, and it's not to count you or to embarrass you or or so I can hunt you down after service and give you a pat on the back, anything like that. But but simply because when we respond physically on the outside to a decision we've made on the inside, it makes it so much more real to us. So on the count of three, if you want to place your trust in Jesus today, I just want you to raise your hand. One, Jesus, I trust you. Two, Jesus, give me your shalom. Three, all across this place. If you're making that decision, just put your hand in the air. Amen. 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 Movement Church, would you pray with me this morning?